prayer before meditation for the 33 day preparation for the total consecration in its rhythm. Prayer for the second period. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. O Mary, Immaculate Bride of the Holy Ghost, Mother of Jesus, my own Mother, my Mistress and Queen, to thee I want to consecrate myself entirely, and through thee I want to belong entirely to Jesus. Implore from the Holy Ghost illumination and fortitude, in order that I may know myself, and that I will be contrite for all my sins out of love of God. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, come through the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy beloved bride. Amen. Act of Consecration. My Queen, my Mother, I give myself entirely to thee, and to show my devotion to thee, I consecrate to thee this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my whole being without reserve. Wherefore, good Mother, as I am thy own. Keep me, guard me as thy property in possession. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of Good Counsel, Seed of Wisdom, Refuge of Sinners, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We are in the second phase, the first week, for the purpose of self-knowledge. And whenever we examine ourselves, if we examine our conscience, we come to the realization of our weakness. We must examine ourselves if we want to progress in the spiritual life more than just examine sins, individual actions. This is very important for a deeper confession, especially for those who go frequently to confession, they should examine not just their venial sins, but they should examine the causes for their venial sins. They should examine more on the virtues, what virtues they have not followed what virtues they have not practiced, and especially the predominant fault, whether they have fallen in, into their predominant fault, because the predominant fault is the cause of the most sins in one particular soul. The predominant fault leads to the most sins which are committed most frequently. It is the predominant fault. We come to the realization at such an examination of our inner corruption. And this is our theme of today. We understand fully our miseries our lack of virtue, and as I said yesterday, when it comes to the total consecration, we also must examine ourselves if we have already consecrated ourselves to the Blessed Virgin Mary, how we have failed in this devotion, whether we have really developed and made progress in a tender love to the Blessed Virgin Mary? How is our confidence to such a matter? How is our dependence, our obedience, 
to the Blessed Virgin. And these are all questions for a deeper examination of conscience. And here we can apply one phrase of the Our Father. Forgive us our trespasses. The examination of uh, um, um, Client of Mary must be our trespasses. Our trespass against our promises of the total consecration with the firm resolution of doing better, of asking more permissions whether we can do certain things and whether we cannot. Foremost, asking how the Blessed Virgin Mary would have acted in our place. What would she have done? How she would have done and why she would have done it. Our innermost corruption, and this is a reality, because of the effects of original sin, which are not totally um, taken away. Our scriptural text today is taken from Romans, chapter 7, verses 14 to 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, The law of God is a spiritual law. But I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I work, I understand not. For I do not, I, I do not that good work which I will. So he says, I'm not doing the good work I'm supposed to do in which I actually want to do. But the evil which I hate, that I do. So in other words, I follow more my inclinations. I follow more sin and, and the attachment to sin, what I really don't want, and what I really want, I don't do. If then I do that which I will not, I consent to the law that it is good. Now then, it is more I do, do, do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that there dwelleth not in me, that is to say in my flesh, that which is good. For to will good is present with me, but to accomplish that which is good, I find not. For the good which I will, I do not. But the evil which I will not, that I do. Now, if I do that which I will not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I have a will to do good, Evil is present with me. For I am delighted with the law of God according to the inward man, that is to say the spiritual man, our soul. But I see another law in my members, fighting against the law of my mind. This is the inclination to sin, concupiscence. The way, the weight which pulls me down to sin. Adam did not have that. The spirit that is to say his intellect and his will were in total command. There were not such a thing than a law in the body. And in order to adjust that a little bit, 
land is given to us. The apostle continues, in captivating me in the law of sin that is in my members. Unhappy man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The grace of God by Jesus Christ our Lord, therefore I myself with the mind serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. We read and consider the words of St. Louis de Montfort in his treatise on the true devotion, today number 78 to 80. This is concerning the third truth regarding the total consecration. He says we need Mary in order to die to ourselves. If we want to go to heaven, in one way or the other, we have to die to ourselves. That is, die to sin. Or in other words, become a saint. To do this effectively and easily, we need the Blessed Virgin Mary. And there is no better way than the total consecration. Our best actions, our our are ordinarily stained and corrupted by our corrupt nature. Because of the lack of purity of intention. If we would have lack, if we would have this purity of intention, and if we would, if there would be no pride in us, in what we are doing, then it would be a different thing. And so even the good actions, if we do it for not the most purest reasons, and sometimes it's a mixed thing, a mixed reason why we do a good thing. We want to give the honor of God, but we want also something for us. That means we already do not have the purity of intention. And so, and that's what he means, even the best actions are corrupted by ourselves. Or take, for example, prayer. Many times, our sinfulness, our inattentiveness, our distractions are the causes for, let's say, a mediocre prayer, not a good prayer. That means our prayer are a little corrupt by our nature. When we put clean, clear water into a vessel which has a foul and evil smell, or wine into a cask, that the inside of which has been tainted by another wine, which has been in it, the clear water and the good wine are spoiled and readily take on the bad odor. In like manner, when God puts into the vessel of a soul spoiled by original sin, an actual sin, his graces and heavenly dose, or the delicious wine of his love, his gifts are ordinarily spoiled and corrupted by the bad leaven, and the evil sin has left within us. Our actions, even the most sublime and virtuous, feel the effects of it. It is therefore of great importance in acquiring or perfection, that means holiness, which it must be remembered is only acquired by union with Jesus Christ. Union with Jesus Christ. This is the third way in the spiritual life is union, the, uni the unitive way. To rid ourselves of everything which is that is bad within us. 
Otherwise, our Lord, who is infinitely pure and, and hates infinitely the least stain upon our souls, <clears throat> will not unite himself to us and will cast us out from his presence. To rid ourselves of self, we must first thoroughly recognize by the light of the Holy Ghost our inward corruption, our incapacity for every good thing useful for salvation, our weakness in all things our inconstancy at all times. Inconstancy. It's a major problem, even for the devotee of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So many times we do the consecration with great enthusiasm, we prepare ourselves very fervently, and then we fall short after that. We forget of it on a daily basis. But that is already inconstancy. Our unworthiness of every grace, our iniquity in every position, this sin of our first father has spoiled us all, soured us, puffed us up, that is bright, corrupted us, as the leaven sours, puffs up and corrupts the dough into which it is put. The actual sins which we have committed, whether mortal or venial, pardoned, though they may be, have nevertheless increased our concupiscence. Every sin weakens the soul. Every sin leaves a wound. Now, in the case of a mortal sin, it's a deadly wound. Spiritually, in the moment we commit a mortal sin, we are dead. Venal sins weakens us. And the proof of this is, so if you go to confession, or when you go to confession, I should say, um, after confession, there is usually great vigor great spiritual energy, seal, and fervor. And then if you're not attentive of avoiding even venal sins, you become negligent, you commit certain venal sins, your vigor, your seal for God, your love of God becomes weaker. And that is what he is talking about. So they increase our disposition for graver sins. Our weakness, our inconstancy, and our corruption, and have left evil remains in our soul. Our bodies are so corrupted that they are called by the Holy Ghost the bodies of sin in Romans conceived in sin, nourished in sin, incapable of all sin, but is subject to thousands of maladies, which go on corrupting from day to day, and which engender nothing but disease, vermin, and corruption. Our soul, united to our body, we consist of body and soul, has become so carnal that it is called flesh, all flesh having corrupted its way. We have nothing for our portion but pride and blindness of spirit. So sometimes we'll even misuse the total consecration for the purpose of pride. We'll think of ourselves how great we are. We are greater and better than others because we have done the consecration. That is an illicit disposition and, and mentality and thought to have.
blindness of spirit. So many people who actually do the consecration have this blindness of spirit. They think they have done it, the consecration, and that's it. But they are not engaging in cultivating the spirit, or as St. Louis de Montfort says, to penetrate its spirit and to apply it to their lives. Hardness of heart, weakness and inconstancy of soul, concupiscence, uh, revolted passions and sicknesses in the body. We are not really prouder than peacocks, more groveling than tars, more wild than unclean animals, more envious than serpents, more gluttonous than the hawks, more furious than tigers, lazier than toises, weaker than treats, and more capricious than weathercocks. We have within ourselves nothing but nothingness and sin, and we deserve nothing but the anger of God and everlasting hell. After this, ought we to be astonished if our Lord has said that whoever wishes to follow him must renounce himself and hate his own life, and that whoever shall love his own life shall lose it, and whosoever shall hate it shall save it. He who is infinite wisdom does not give commandments without reason, and he has commanded us to hate ourselves only because we are so richly deserved to be hated. Nothing is worthy of love than God, and nothing is worthier in, of hatred than ourselves. And what that all means in detail, we will uh, discuss in other, in other conferences this week, because it's a very important um, issue in the total consecration. Because if we are not convinced of our need, of our misery, as the children, the poor children of Mary, our own corruption will never be dependent totally on the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we first need to understand that we are weak, and the proof of this weakness is that we are ready at any moment to not follow the maxims of this devotion. That we follow our own way. We don't even ask what the Blessed Virgin Mary would do now. We are not inviting her to be a companion in our occupation. To guide us whatever we do right now. We don't invite her to pray with us and other things. This is not meant to depress us. This is to clean out house, to realize a fact and so you see, by all these considerations, there could be a much deeper examination of conscience. God, in his all mercy, sometimes hides um, certain imperfections from us. Otherwise, we will be very, very discouraged. But it is sometimes good to go deeper into our soul and to examine its weaknesses the lack of virtue, the lack of loyalty to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and so forth. We continue with the imitation of Christ in the third book, chapter 20. The confession of our own infirmity 
in the miseries of, uh, of this life. I will confess against myself my injustice. I will confess to thee, O Lord, my infirmity. And that's what we should do. Whenever we pray to our Father, we should acknowledge our fault, our guilt, that we have not honored the Blessed Virgin Mary enough, that we have not been enough child and childlike in relation to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is oftentimes a small thing which casts me down and troubles me. Is this not the truth? I make a resolution to behave myself valiantly, but when a small temptation comes, I am brought into great traits. This is the weakness of man. A little thing appears and we fall. That's how weak we are. A little temptation for impatience. A little temptation of sensuality. And we become weak. That's how weak we are. I make a resolution. It is sometimes a very trifling thing from which proceeds a grievous temptation. That's how it starts. A little thing. And when I think myself somewhat safe, I find myself sometimes, when I at least apprehend it, almost overcome with a small blast. Behold then, O Lord, my objection and frailty, every way known to thee. Have pity on me and draw me out of the mire that I stick not fast therein, that I may not be utterly cast down forever. This it is which often drives me back and confounds me in thy sight, to find that I am so subject to fall and have so little strength to resist my passions. And although I do not altogether consent, Yet the assaults are troublesome and grievous to me, and it is exceedingly irksome to live thus always in a conflict. It is the conflict between the spirit and the flesh. Hence my infirmity is made known to me, because wicked thoughts do always much more easily rush in upon me, then depart. And God allows it to show us how weak we really are, how less virtuous we really are. O oh, that thou, the most mighty God of Israel, the zealous love of faithful souls, wouldst behold the labor and sorrow of thy servant, and stand by me in all my undertakings. Strengthen me with heavenly fortitude, lest the old man, the miserable flesh, not fully subject to the spirit, prevail and get the upper hand, against which we must fight as long as we breathe in this most wretched life. Alas, what kind of life is this, where affliction and miseries are never wanting, where all things are full of snares and enemies? For when one tribulation or temptation is gone, another cometh. This is life. And we might think this is normal, in a sense it is, because we have never experienced how it is if there is no temptation whatsoever, namely in heaven. 
if you could go just for one minute to heaven, you would understand how miserable this life is upon this earth. Ye advise the first, the last, many others come on in these unexpected. How can a life be loved that has such great bitterness, that is subject to so many calamities and miseries? Of course, most of the people don't care about that, but a person who wants to go to heaven, a person who wants to become holy, needs to be concerned with these things. How can it be called life, since it begets so many deaths and plagues? It's re referring to sin. And yet it is loved, and many seek their delight in it. Many blame the world that it is deceitful and vain, yet they are not willing to quit it. There are so many conservatives, there are so many traditionalists who blame everything on the evil world. At the same time, they're engaging a great deal in the world. But the evils and the sins, they all blame on the world, but not on themselves. Many blame the world that is deceitful and vain, yet they are not willing to quit it, because the concupiscence of the flesh over much prevails. But there are some things that draw them to love the world. There's something, even though they hate the modern world, there's still something which they love in this world, of ours, others to despise it. The concupiscence of the flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life, draw to the love of the world, but the pains and miseries which justly follow these things breed a hatred and loathing of the world. But alas, the pleasure of sin prevails over the worldly soul, and under these prayers she imagines there are delights, because she has neither seen nor tasted the sweetness of God, nor the internal pleasure of virtue. But they that perfectly despise the world and study the life of and study to live to God under holy discipline, experience the divine sweetness that is promised to those who forsake all, and such clearly see how grievously the world is mistaken and how in many ways it is imposed upon. And here, of course, it is the solution of all of that is a very close, intimate, tender devotion to Mary, because overall she is, the Mother of God is the refuge of sinners, and she is a good mother. She is co-redemptrix. She is also reparatrix, that means the one who repairs and how. There's also this devotion which is very, very uh, public now because Francis has a particular inclination to this devotion, the German devotion, under this title of our Blessed Lady, the Undoer of Nuts, that means the Undoer of Problems. Is an old devotion in Germany at a particular church in Augsburg 
which is called the undoer of nerds, and that goes in the same, in the same, um, uh, goes along the same theme that we um, realizing our weaknesses, and because of our weaknesses, we need the Blessed Virgin Mary. We need to go to her, entrust ourselves, and St. Louis in the Mundford doesn't speak of it, but we should cast upon her our guilt, our want of virtue. It is like when a child, a boy, let's say, breaks a window of a neighbor. The mother will come and pay for the harm her child has done to the neighbor, namely breaking the window with a, with a, with a football, with a ball. So the mother will come and restore the window, pay for the window. And thus does the Blessed Virgin Mary. She needs to, and she will, repair the harm we have done. The harm which we have done to our soul and the harm which we have done to others. Because she is our mother. And therefore, she might still give us a certain discipline to do. That is, she might give us a, a small punishment like what mothers do. But she will undo the harm we have caused. So therefore, we also should really go to her with great confidence as the refuge of sinners, with contrition of her, deep contrition, and entrust to her not just our body and soul, our, our possessions, spiritual and materially, but also our faults with great confidence in the refuge of sinners. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are the most women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary. Bless us, Mary, Mother mine. May divine assistance in all this business. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.